from Sam on email. Hello to you, Sam. He says the following. I went to the Arsenal PSG game on Tuesday and found it appalling that fans were streaming out of the stadium at the 80-minute mark while we, Arsenal, were 2-0 up and while the PSG fans were still all half-naked and having a party. I know it's a Tuesday night. I know Arsenal were all but set to win, but three years ago, this would have been a shock result and I imagine everyone would have sat in the ground to revel in the win. I assume this is happening across the country and the continent for winners and losers. So when, if at all, is it OK to leave if your team is winning or losing? Are Arsenal fans and fans of other successful clubs becoming too spoilt with our team's success that we don't need to revel in the slaying of a European giant? And on the flip side, when you're down 4-0 at home, should you stay to support or leave in protest? I will hand this over to Vish and Andy, but before I do, I'll just say one word in response to the first question. Wembley. Vish. <laughs> uh, and I'll say another. Um, transport specifically yeah. uh, train transport is awful in this country I, I, I think if um, if people want to leave early I've never had a problem with that everyone has a different reason for doing so um, and even if you're fed up I think that's totally fine I've told this story before and I'll tell it again but my um, best mate from uni he comes from a family of Blackburn fans his dad did, used to do this thing that whenever they brought on Chef Kikuchi he would leave and listen to the rest of the game in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Who was top scorer for Crystal Palace once? As we found out on yesterday's yesterday. show, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but he, uh, yeah, like loads of people leave for different reasons. I don't think there's a problem with it because it's so hard getting to games now. It is so... But you're taking the ticket from someone who would quite like to stay to the end, maybe. The, yeah, maybe maybe you are. But then, like, I don't know, unless you want to go out and round out, you know, you know, round up all the people who are leaving early and ask them to hand over their ticket, then I don't think it works that way. Um, so I, I don't necessarily have a problem with it as to whether, um, you know, whether people are taking victory or, you know, longer term success for granted. Again, I think that changes to a point, doesn't it? Because if you're, you know, if total network solutions were hanging on to a one nil win. The new Saints now. Yeah, the very new Saints, fish. sorry. Yeah. Um, the, the art, if the artist previously known as total <laughs> network solutions were hanging on to, you know, one nil lead against Fiorentina, obviously no one's going to leave. You know, when they were 2 0 down as early as that was, or if they were. They're not going to leave down. anyway. I mean, they're playing for your team yeah. in the European that, game. That's the point yeah. I was going to make. Yeah, they're, they're not going to do that. It's about very different things. And I don't really have a problem with it. And I think taking it for granted is probably a, a little bit like yelling at clouds way of, of talking about this particular thing, given what I suppose the point I flippantly mentioned at the start that it is the transport in this country for evening games in particular especially on Sundays, is god-awful. And I feel else, so bad for anyone who has to navigate that. Did anyone else think during that preston Fulham penalty shootout that went on for ages that all the away fans are missing their train? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, oh, it's, it's, it's weird, so that's, but that's it, part it, it of does it. ping into your mind. But Andy, it? before I bring you in, I just want to, you know, we, we, we must show some empathy with normal match-going fans. Now, you guys both work in... In the industry, so you, you know, it's not quite the I same also, experience. I also pay to get in a lot. I know you do. I, I know you do, but I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not denigrating you yet. <laughs> but what I am going to say is, what I am going to say is, disappointed. If you are someone who perhaps did get, didn't get the opportunity to go to a really great game that you wanted to go to, and you have to watch it on TV, and yeah, you know, there are some people. I, I, I remember when I was at Fratton Park a lot, and actually I've seen it a lot at Spurs as well. I go there a bit now. I've also seen it at Fulham in recent seasons. Regardless of the scoreline, some people do just get up and leave. Yeah. And if you if you if you want if you want a ticket and you can't get one and you're watching it on TV or in the pub and you go, I bloody love to be there, and you see fans getting up and leave and you know crying about transport and you know all the rest of it, it's a bit like, well, okay, but the infrastructure in the UK is crap. We all know that. But you know that when you buy the ticket, you pay your money, it takes your chance. I'm not talking about necessarily a big away day, 300 mile round trip on a Tuesday night. That's perhaps a little bit different, but it really is. You you, you pay, you go and support, and you support. Now, before I bring you in, Andy, I'll just say one more thing. My wife grew up watching American sport, right? So she used to go Boston Bruins, Patriots, um, Celtics, right? Mm. Her and her family are absolutely adamant. They are Adam Ant <laughs> that um, you never ever leave. No matter what the score is, you mm. never ever leave because you're there to support the guy, the team, and that's the cultural thing that they kind of grew up in. Um, what do you make of all this? And I f I feel like that as well. Unpick all those things for to, me. To, to be honest, I, I I feel like the result shouldn't affect when you leave 
Um, it, it's never really affected when I leave, to be perfectly honest. And I've always, I think until kids would religiously stay until the end. That's different. I think if you've got like kids who are under 10 and you want to avoid 50,000 people leaving at once or right. even 9,000 people leaving so at that's once. that's a fair point. I think that's a, a, a reasonable thing. But I also think your point is a very good one, Luke, a, a, about um, when uh, Sam says um, three years ago this would have been a shock result and I imagine everyone would have sat in the ground to revel in the win. I don't think the result affects when people leave or not. There was this guy who, when I watched Wimbledon at Selhurst Park, an old fella who used to sit a couple of seats along from us, and obviously you would notice when he left, because in a seating area he'd say, excuse me, and go past. I, I, I remember like saying to my friend, when we were beating uh, Man United 1-0 in the cup replay, saying, I, I bet he leaves with five minutes to go, like mm. he normally does. And we're like, hanging on. It was the one where uh, you know Peter Schmeichel scored that overhead kick. And yeah. it, got, it got ruled out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He missed that. He was already yeah. in his car. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you know, people have the famous story about George Best missing the um, end of the um, of the Barcelona '99 Barcelona final against. Yeah, Bayern Munich. although we can't say why he left. You know, oh, I maybe, think I've got a good idea why George Best left early. But no, no, but maybe, maybe actually you can't lie about dead as well. So say what you want. I'm I'm saying the, the, the <laughs> disappointment of how the game went or how the game was going because United you know, didn't look like getting back into it. And sure, but you are George no, Best. It's a May not a European final. <clears throat> yeah, sure. But I'm, I'm saying to presume that we know why he left and whether that was habitually part of his thing. Of course, if you're gonna, if you're super famous and you're gonna get recognised, that's that's another. Yeah, you want to quickly get away, don't you? Uh, yeah. And that, that that goes into something else other than what what Sam's talking about. Yeah, the the thing about um, you know everyone would have stayed in the ground and appreciated it a bit more. I suppose. Yeah, I, I don't really know what I think of that because I I don't think that is necessarily the case maybe more people would have stayed because the novelty of it would have been fresh but you know you still have like you were talking about kids there in particular and also like you know your, your man from your Wimbledon days who would the old guy who would get up and go like people like the convenience of being able to see their team and you know leave in peace I suppose we were just talking outside about um you know how bad trains are full stop because yeah. we both took some uh, last week. And I think generally, like if you've got kids or if you're elderly, then there is that, yeah, there is that bind there. I think what, I, I appreciate this question doesn't uh, posit this as a, as a subject per se, but I thought it was really interesting what was happening at Spurs at the start of the season with regards to getting rid of the um, OAP discount for tickets. Yeah. And the arguments that were being had online between people who qualified for those tickets and people in their mid-twenties, you know, obviously the research is out there and we all know how difficult, um, you know, young 20-somethings have it at the moment in terms of, I suppose, financial prospects full stop. Mm. But the argument was made that like, well, why, why should it not also be discounted for us? If you're looking at, you know, I suppose like the financial capabilities of different generations, then would it not also yeah, show so, that you so would have in modern like in, in modern society? You know, the metrics show that people of that age are far more as a as a whole are far more financially. Um, comfortable than, than people in their 20s right? yeah, so it's, the yeah. idea was it's an antiquated way of doing it yeah, a yeah. discount but what's what's the relevance of the questions what were you going to so say the, but the, the offshoot of that was that uh, there were it was deemed that there were a lot of people just comfy in their like seats per se and that younger generation wanted to come through you know I suppose even just some uh, something as simple as physically were able to go to more games and therefore wanted those basically those tickets on offer at the very least that if you're if you're not willing to pay for them then get rid of then then don't you know don't renew your ticket and let someone else go in don't yeah, just right complain about yeah, it yeah but I, I, I suppose yeah. this is this is like a I guess how like it's about being appreciative of the seat I suppose yes, yeah I, I guess it's the difference to how you um how you embrace the experience and maybe that's the difference between say German football and English football, for example. Whereas in German football... We're better. There, that it? Yeah, that's it. There, there, <laughs> in, in German football, there's very much a sense of, I am a participant in this. Yeah. I, I don't think that exists so much in English football anymore. Partly because it's so expensive and you think, I've paid a lot, you need to entertain me and then maybe I will respond. It's a little bit like when you go to concerts in London. Maybe it'll be the same <laughs> as Juice D's. I hope not. <laughs> I, 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 well, I, think, I hope you don't get a ticket. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> 
can we get on with this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think uh, another point to bring out, and when Vish is quite rightly talking about the modern context of it, where Sam uh, says, uh, are Arsenal fans becoming too spoiled with our team's success that we don't need to revel in the success of slaying a European giant? I think there is something in that, in, in the sense of there's so much football. It's like maybe you feel a little bit less like, right, I need to stay to the end because sure. there's going to be... Two more games next so week. It's not as valuable as a, as a as a proposition because there's so much of it. I, I would I would I would take this in a slightly different direction um, and say that I think that I obviously don't know Sam, so I'm not suggesting he's doing it personally. But I think a lot of these types of discussions um, are fueled or underwritten by a lot of fans having a rivalry with other fans about whose fans are proper and whose aren't. And when I yeah. say proper, I mean like in inverted commas proper. You know, who's got proper fans, who hasn't? Who's got plastic fans, who, who hasn't? Like Arsenal fans will love, love nothing more, of course, than seeing Spurs fans leave early, whether they're watching it on TV or it's a game against them or whatever. And vice versa, we can see you sneaking out. Think is there a stream a of West Ham fans from the Olympic Stadium? Yeah. That is was there a fire drill, etc., etc.? Et yeah, I think a lot of the, yeah, I suppose this question might be fueled from a, God, I've defended us on social media. Mm. Why are you leaving? Come on, they yeah. can see that. I know, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I think what, 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 I mean, not to extrapolate too much, but what to, to ever affect? Because what we're almost talking about here as well is, is also the fan experience, right? So we talked a lot about transport and price of the tickets and stuff like that. The, the fan experience is never going to be better and it's never going to be improved. And I include things like transport links and stuff like that because clearly, you know, take Spurs as an example. They have tried to get transport links better around there and it's been really difficult for bureaucratic reasons and planning mm. reasons and stuff like that. But more clubs undoubtedly could collaborate more with local transport uh, companies and mm. with councils have to make it better, but they don't. And the reason they don't is because football fans would far much, far more prefer to spend all their time calling their rival team's fans plastics than actually clubbing together and making something happen. Yeah, exactly. And, and, that'll, never, and that'll never change. And as long as that never changes... Um, football fans don't have their eyes on the real the real problem, which is mm. the money people, the people running the game, the people yeah. who don't give a shit about them, the people who, who take advantage of their unwavering loyalty to exploit them. And people, fans will will claim to be annoyed that they're being exploited, yet they'll still let themselves be exploited. There are some exceptions, the Super League and one or two others, but broadly speaking, they're going to suck it up and get on with it. Mm. And that's really the problem here. So if, if fans take it upon themselves that they have to leave if they're older or they're not comfortable with their kids leaving at the same time, really, that's football's problem. And football should be sorting that out, but no one's making them do it. Mm. And that's why it's not happening. So I kind of agree with you both in a weird way. I think if you've paid your money, I said Wembley at the start of this, you pay your money and you go up to Wembley and watch a game. Yeah, good luck getting out of that if you've got any plans for the rest of the day. You know, that's that's a shambles and, and fans are kind of within their rights to try and circumvent that if they can. But I also see why people are passionate about it and want to support their team um, through thick and thin and I respect that as well. So, look, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, Sam, but at least we discussed a lot of the issues there. Our friend Moon on Discord, very active Discorder and a man who I have discussed parenting with on more than one occasion on the uh, parenting channel on the uh, Football Ramble Discord. There's a parenting uh, channel? There is. There is, yeah. Oh, parents, right. listen, parents listen to the show. Parents present this show, Vish. <laughs> yeah. Some of us are very fertile. Don't hold it against us. Um, Marcus. <laughs> um, some of us smoke 40 a day. Could be lit. <laughs> Might not be. Um, whatever happened to managerial mind games, did, uh, asks Moon. Did they retire when little known Carabao Cup winner Sir Alex Ferguson retired? Swear no one ever talks about mind games anymore. Now, this caught my eye. It's a really great point. If you think about. For people of our age appreciate we're a bit older than you, Vish, but generally speaking, people of our generation, golden era Premier League stuff, classic Barkley stuff. A lot of it was managerial mind games. Keegan, Ferguson, Wenger, Mourinho. These were big, big figures doing big amounts of kidology and we loved it. Does it happen as much now? I yes. don't think I don't think it does, Andy. Tell me where it does. Tell me who's doing it. I, I, I guess the, the, the thing is, if you're talking about the Premier League, there are less obnoxious managers than there used to be. Maybe, maybe that's that's part of it. And I think if you look at the big rivalry of like the last couple of years, if you look at Manchester City versus Liverpool. It's been strictly quite a sporting rivalry, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's, it's, it feels plight. Yeah, a, a little bit. There's 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 a little bit too much respect there. Now, I, I when I was picking apart this question by Moon, I thought, are we talking about what's happened to the mind games, or are we talking about the use of the phrase mind games, which of course 
wasn't coined by Ferguson. It was coined by Jose Mourinho when he was at Porto talking about Sir Alex Ferguson because he's in a press conference mm. where he's speaking in Portuguese and then he breaks off into English because he knows it will go around the world. And they, 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 they said, it was the season that Porto won the European Cup. And, I remember it. Yeah, I remember it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, he, and he, they said, um, what's, what's, what's the difference between uh, this and Man United in the last round? And he went, no mind games. Yeah, and it, 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 was, it was fantastic. So, so the question is, I think we interpret the question as in the mind games just don't happen as much anymore. I agree with Moon. I, I think if you look down the list of managers that are present in the Premier League, it's very difficult to pinpoint one that loves a bit of that action. And there might be one of the reasons for that might well be that um, in the case of Wenger and Ferguson particularly, they're obviously around for a long old time. So over time, they're going to get into fucking scrapes. But Guardiola's been there for ages. So He I doesn't go after other managers. I, and, I, and the reason I think Guardiola hasn't been embroiled in any of that is because of just the greater flow of information at the moment. Because, and Ferguson and, and Wenger have talked about this a bit, but often when managers have those press conferences... They often have a little bit on the side where they will talk to a lot of the journalists off the record and this, that and the other. And sometimes it'll happen afterwards. Sometimes it'll happen before. Right, good insight. And more, more often than not, they'll happen, they'll happen afterwards. And even this just is like, like a pressure valve, is it? Well, even this is just like hanging around, um, you know, waiting for the press conference to start and, and stuff like that. So it's not, sometimes not even in, in an official capacity. And back then, what used to happen is they'd be like, oh, did you hear what that Wenger said about you? No, what did he say? Well, he's talking about like you know the referees are all on your side and stuff like that. He said that, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you just can't do that mm. because everything is videoed, mm. everything is recorded. Um, if a manager wants clarity on what someone else has said about them, they will have it almost immediately. Um, and I suppose there are just more receipts. Full stop. So I take the point, Vish. But sorry to cut, cut in, but just to give you that, that doesn't mean per se that a manager can't say something on the record that is deliberately meant to wind up or to yeah, but, another manager. But, but, but that was fuel. You, you know, the example you gave there was a relationship that initially was fueled by dislike of one another, which was perpetuated by the he said, she said stuff. And I don't think that sure. happens anymore. So, so, because okay. they, I think people are a bit more, people are more wary of journalists and, and the information that they give them and the way that questions are posited. Um, the example that comes to mind straight away, which I appreciate is not a manager thing, is during the Euros where whoever it was uh, that journalist asked the question of an England player, uh, what do you think of um, Gary Lineker's criticism, uh, oh, which, right, which the player yeah. hadn't heard, and he framed it as, or oh, do you think he should stick to selling crisps? That's right, yeah. W when was the last time Gary Lineker sold crisps? The only yeah. reason that question was asked was to basically provoke... I'm going to make an educated reaction. guess that that was Gary, Gary Cottrell. I don't think it was, actually. All right, it must have been David Craig. No, it, it wasn't a Sky Sports uh, reporter. It All was, right, uh, Brian Glanville? <laughs> 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 have you run out of journalism? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, okay, so what about this then? Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting point. What about this for an angle then, Andy? Or, or Vish as well. Um you know, the type of character you may need to be now to be a manager at the top level in the modern game is a different type of character, perhaps. Yeah. Um, because if you look down the list of the managers in the Premier League at the moment, I don't think many of them get involved in this stuff. Perhaps I don't feel like they need to for the reasons Vicious said. Perhaps it's a lot more analytical now and you've got to be a lot more um, um, cerebral about it. Do you, mean, do you mean that in terms of like you almost don't have time for it? No, I, yeah, partly, but I also think that what unifies those great managers of the past probably not not entirely but certainly a part of it would be some big charisma right yeah being the lord of all you survey you know being this kind of main guy this big alpha and of course you probably you definitely still need a bit of that now but if you get on the list of managers that still manage in the premier league at the moment how many of them have really got got it in them even you know, dice probably has got it in him <laughs> he was the immediate yeah. one yeah yeah, um, yeah i'd say Ange has got it in him poster has got it in him yeah. for sure um, perhaps Nuno, perhaps um, Marco Silva can be a bit spiky. But do you know, Maresca do you know, can be a bit spiky, but he's very new on the block. You know, it, it, I just think it's so transient now and so analytical now, so many numbers bods that perhaps, perhaps there's just not much of a place for it. Maybe, and I, I would say there's too much football, and I, I don't think that's your answer to every have, question. It is. What do you want for dinner but tonight? I, it's just too much football. I, I don't think yeah, because every every, every but I don't pre, think the every have appetite for, uh, the coaches have appetite yeah. for it. Mm. Because every every, um, every post match presser is a preview to another game now, isn't it? It yeah, can exactly. be, yeah. And so it, the cycle is is relentless. And also little things like you know the point you made about there about analytical coaches. There's almost a, a broader sense of you know 
because of the duty there are, you know, that what's expected of those coaches and managers now. Even the fact that I feel like we refer more to head coaches now than we do to managers yeah. because it's almost like the position has become obsolete. Um, it is so much about grooving. And, and I suppose, actually, maybe the change in media has come about because there are, you know, because it's not just the newspapers, because there's more stuff online, including at the newspapers, so that there's great scope to ask about tactics and stuff like that. Mm. And you can almost, I feel like managers are more uh, hyper aware of being able to bend the media in, in a certain way. And what it used to be by, you know, throwing a bit of dynamite here and there, which Allardyce still does, obviously. Um, you he's, know, he's, he's not managing now, though, is he? No, but, but it wasn't that long ago that he was talking about how he was a better man than, than Pep. Was it ahead of the Man yeah. City game? That, he basically threw that out there and he's like, right, that's me sorted. For, that's, a, that's a mind game for, to himself so he could eventually try and get a hard on again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess the, the all, the, all that was missing was the orange. You mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when we're when we're talking about though that that level of saturation, and Vish is absolutely right about the scheduling, and you just don't have that much time to to, to get into it. I think if we're looking at the last when we when we think of these these great like managerial rivalries, and Ferguson Wenger is obviously the big one. What was the last one that we felt had real potential? It was when you had Pep Guardiola at Manchester City and Jose Mourinho at Manchester United. Yeah. But what happened with them at Barcelona and Real Madrid is so much was made of the fact that Pep was exhausted by it, that, you know, he looked knackered by the end of it. And, you know, of course, he has that famous outburst where yeah. um, he gets as Vish was saying, told something that Mourinho said and he, he goes into this sweary rant where he goes, yeah. he, he's the fucking boss in this arena and all, yeah. all, all this sort of stuff. I can't compete and with then, And Mourinho, that was Mourinho's angle really, wasn't it? That yeah, was really yeah. the angle that Mourinho had identified and said, I can do that. It was, but because of that, and because that's so well remembered, people completely overlook how much the Real Madrid experience and competing at a high level with Barcelona and Pep Guardiola for a very long time absolutely exhausted Mourinho. So when we see the two... Who was then at that point living in, in a hotel. You can't yeah. really kick off when you live well, in a hotel. Well, well we're talk we're yeah, we're talking about later down the line when yeah. they actually get to Manchester mm. now. So by the time when they actually get to Manchester, even though on paper we all think, oh, this is going to be fireworks, neither of them actually have the appetite mm. for it. And I think really that conditions everything that happened since. That's a really good point. Um, it's really nicely articulated. I think I'll just add um, that there was potential with Klopp and Guardiola for a while. Because Klopp's quite a, quite an explosive character. He says things... And they're very different. They, that's the thing. So I, yeah. I think your point about Guardiola versus Mourinho at Barcelona and Real Madrid, respectively, hangs true for Klopp as well. Because Guardiola is clearly just like, I'm not getting involved in that again. Mm. I'm not doing that again. And Klopp didn't seem to really come after Guardiola that much, did he, overall? Even though Klopp was quite emotionally led, he would he would he would seem to transfer his ire onto um officials mm. and people running the game. Because he went into that big he had that big thing about kickoff times, didn't he, and stuff like that as well. So he definitely had it in him. Does that not count as a mind game? Yeah, I suppose it does, but it's not a managerial mind game. No, it's, it's a, not, yeah. It's about it's about the authorities, isn't it? I like? guess that that goes back to what you were saying. Their their focus is directed elsewhere, really, isn't it? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, maybe the final point just to make on this question, which is a really good one, is that um, is. the same reason that this has probably drifted off a bit is probably the same reason that um, the players are very different in terms of profile now. And I don't want to be this kind of dad who sits on an armchair and says there's no characters in the game anymore. But it is a fact that the way players are produced now is far different to what it was before. Mm. And you, you're much more likely to have these almost like replicant type players like Phil Foden or um, Rico Lewis. or And they're amazing players and the game's much better for it because you see so, so much more top quality football but these they're not really and I mean this with love and respect they're not really quote unquote normal people mm. and so perhaps there's just no room for it in the same way with managers because it's so relentless there's so many games you have to be so much more analytical you have to have a different type of mind maybe there's just not the room for it anymore but anyway it's a good question it's worth thinking about one of those questions when it came up I was like yeah I never thought about that before but that is absolutely spot on what about this from Alex otherwise known as Big Old Boomer on the Discord um, this is an interesting one as well why is it that so many players are going back to clubs where they've played previously is it due to new financial rules increased player power or something else it seems like this trend has increased 
increased a lot over the past few years. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Now, before I get your guys' thoughts, a few examples here. Uh, Jao Felix returned to Chelsea from Atletico Madrid to make the Conor Gallagher deal work. Ilkay Gundogan, of course, has returned to Man City from Barcelona. Danny Olmo went back to Barcelona from RB Leipzig, having been there um, you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, Thiago Silva returned to the last club he played for in Brazil. Um, Angel Di Maria is back at Benfica. Uh, Ivan Perisic briefly went back to his boyhood cl- uh, boyhood club, Hadrick Split. Um, only being paid a euro a month, apparently, so he could play there. Um, now, let me just separate these out. The ones who go back at the end of their career because they love it, it's pretty explainable, right? Yes. I mean, everyone can relate yes. to that. You know, if you, know, if you were a professional footballer yourself and you had an amazing career, would you love to go back to your hometown club and be a legend? I'm sure you, you would. So that's kind of explainable. The ones like Felix, Gunduan, perhaps even Olmo, um, Xavi Simons as well, who's gone back to PSG, of course. Is there anything in that, Andy? Uh, I think there's is, a is there a reason for this? When, when you're separating it out, when you're talking about Joao Felix and Gunduan, you're talking about a relationship between the clubs that has developed from, I, I, I guess, the sense of you know mutual benefit. But I think when you're talking about Danny Olmo, that's different. That's closer to, and I guess it shows how much Barcelona think about things in the same way, despite the fact they've got very different financial circumstances. It's a bit more like the Cesc Fabregas deal. It's like, not only is this, a good, this guy a good player, he knows how we like to do things here, which is really important. Right. Now, the Cesc Fabregas deal, like when he went back to Barcelona, didn't work at all because of the age at which he went to Arsenal. So he arrived at Arsenal when he was... 16. What, just turned 15. 15, yeah. And With a great mullet haircut, if you remember. Oh, spectacular. Yeah. Like, you, you look at today's mullets and you think... Fabregas is having all of these. Oh, don't, don't For you? sure. 100%. Said like a man who hasn't watched many an Australian sports person as I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of them out there. I was, they're all um, absurd. I was um, at an industry thing yesterday doing a, um, doing, a, doing a thing and one of the guys who worked for the company I was visiting uh, is Australian. Mm. And uh, I turned up and I saw him, mullet and moustache, just because of course he has. Like it's, it was, it, it was just me, it seemed like the most natural thing in the world. That has overtaken Australian life, like you wouldn't believe. Hasn't yeah. It? Did you go up to him like, oh, you must be Mitch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have actually got a friend called Mitch who's Australian, who was exactly the same, moustache, mullet, See? and he's the only person. I loved him. I love him. Great guy. <laughs> I loved him. I, I, I haven't seen him for years. Um, the only guy I've ever met who would use the term cunt as an endearment. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, he's a good cunt. Yeah. He's a GC. <laughs> good cunt. Unbelievable cunt, that yeah. one. <laughs> Eddie, Andy, carry on before we, before we take this show into the gutter. Yeah, so... We, 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 Fabregas. You're about Fabregas about, at Arsenal at yeah, 15. Yeah, we're talking about Fabregas at Arsenal. So, Barcelona, get him back. They spent ages trying to get him back. What is like two, three, maybe even four years in the making, getting yeah. him back. And at that point, they're like, we're so good, we need a specific type of player to make us better. And a player who understands how Barcelona play. Like when I came to get you two for the ramble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they, they bring him back, and what they get is a player who, as an adult, has been forged in the Premier League. And he gets back there and he goes, oh, this is boring. It's so yeah. mechanical. Yeah. And, you know, he just likes bombing forward like Brian Robson or yeah. Robbie Earl, basically. That's Robbie what, Earl getting a shout. Robbie Earl. Love it, right? <laughs> that, that, that's what he likes to do. So Barcelona doesn't work for him and he doesn't work for, for Barcelona. So would you... I, I appreciate it's not... So you're talking about that in terms of Fabregas going back, yeah? Mm. Uh, so one of the things I, I was I find fascinating about this particular question is things like... Um, Comfort outside outside the pitch, off the pitch, mm, essentially, yeah. in terms of, um, you know, where you're based and the life you lead and the point in your life where you go to those places and, you know, if it's at a certain time, you establish roots there. So that when you go elsewhere, you end up coming back. Mm. And also style of play. And I suppose your, your memories of that place and wanting to go back there. Could you say that... Fabregas rather he didn't return to Arsenal but he did return to London and he did return to the Premier League yeah he did absolutely and I, I think he, he scratched that itch whereas I think him going back to Barcelona was just you know prove myself in front of my people it's, yeah. it's, it's like a, a necessary coronation and it was an exciting that, time for yeah it was brilliant yeah. but it's necessary for his ego but, as, but, as, as well I think let me get down to the point of this though because big old boomer has has identified what he thinks is a pattern in football recently. What I'd love to know from you guys is, 
is this actually a pattern or is this just every transfer is on its own merits? It happens because it happens for all these different reasons and there's no point extrapolating a pattern from it. It's just a coincidence. I, I, I don't think it is entirely a pattern, but if it is a pattern, because I think you can even separate Joao Felix and Gundogan, whereas there's a financial necessity to the Joao Felix and there's the relationship between Chelsea and Atletico, which goes back over a decade, by the way, in terms of financial mm. symbiosis. But you look at Gundogan and he as I've said in the ramble before, is like, you know, Roy Keane with a degree in that he goes out there to Barcelona. He's like, none of you lot want to win. This is bullshit. Mm. This is nothing like what it was. I've had a look through your accounts here. I'm fucking off. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So that's what Gundogan's base experience was. So yeah, he's he's gone out there and he's realised, actually, the grass isn't greener on the other side. I'm still competitive Mm. and I want to win. So it's it's, it's very much a, a personal decision. So those home comforts, are wanting to to, to win mm. basically, which is which is quite kind of like if I let you go back to the Guardian for six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you want to prove it to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a Fabregas yeah. here. If you look at Rag, I know you don't want to win. <laughs> I'm used to more and a Hunter Raja. <laughs> so yeah, but, the the other aspect of the, of those transfers as well, though, is it, does it not also speak to the mess of the current financial situation in European football that? while it is also about the teams that have money, you can only end up doing business in certain ways with teams you have debt with. Right. Yeah. Nice. Because, Good angle. Yeah, because while you can also like... Because, for example, if um, Barcelona and the way they've done transfers recently have basically been on a promise mm. that they will never go bankrupt because they're Barcelona. Yeah. In the same way that Coca-Cola can never go... will never go bankrupt. It's too iconic to go bankrupt. Mm. That doesn't mean it doesn't fluctuate, but... As, as Walter White says, you really want to live in a world without classic Coke? <laughs> <laughs> you know? There you go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it was almost like, right, he's... Um, you know, Gundogan wants to go... If we sell him, there are so many machinations to that. Like we might as well just try and give him back to City. <laughs> and obviously, City were willing to have him. But you know, there was a point where I appreciate it, this is a little bit different now. But when City, when Gundogan was leaving City, Arsenal were all over it, yeah. and it didn't come to pass. Well, well, I think I think what it is there is the player is fishing for a particular move, right? Okay. And Barcelona facilitate it because they want to get his money off the books. Yeah, but, yeah. but I think you're absolutely right in in terms of. In modern football, there is a very small circle of business where you can actually get stuff done. A very small circle of clubs who have similar aims and similar means. Memes? Means? Yeah. And memes. And yeah. memes. We've got memes as Jamie well. Vardy. But or um, if, or uh, Neil Mopai. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Mean. But I think if you look at Kylian Mbappe, for example, <laughs> when the point comes to him leaving PSG, everyone knows where he's going. <laughs> but if he wasn't going there... How many other clubs would there be sure. where he could realistically go? Two? Yeah. But on, on that's a good point. I think on the returning to clubs, though, is there an element here, just one final angle, just in case it's of interest that I want to bring, is the idea that because you are, you're under pressure from PSR now, you um, the money change in hands in some cases is big, certainly for wages, if not transfer fees. Um, you may just want to go after a player that you know as well. It's one less. What, what we talk about in the, in the entertainment industry, for example, is de-risking, right? The idea that you can you commission something, you do something, you work with someone, and you're trying to de-risk as much as possible. There's a good amount. Man City could have seen other, perhaps, midfield players they could have gone after, maybe. Yes. Maybe not in this specific situation, but just as a general example. But they're de-risking by going for Gundogan because they know his character. Everyone knows him. He's played there before. The fans will accept him. There's so fewer variables. He'll settle in the area. Though. Exactly. That's yeah. true. But that, that's, that's got to be part I, of it, I, though. I think that's an, it, it's an opportunity rather than an, an initially stated aim, hmm. which which is different. It's, it's not part of the strategy. It's just an opportunity that come, has come up and they've thought, oh, OK, we can do something with this. This can hmm. work for us. Because I think... If you look at how transfers have moved across the continent over the past 15 years, you can say that this is definitely not a new thing. If you look at, say, the Dortmund team that gets into the Champions League final in 2013, the Atletico team that gets into the Champions League finals in 2014 and 2016, these sort of like A minus, not quite elite, but sort of aspiring to be absolute elite clubs. Yeah. What do they do after getting to those finals and just falling short? They spend a lot of the following years thinking, oh, yeah, let's do it. Let's bring back Goethe. Let's bring back Felipe Luiz. Let's bring back Diego Costa, which was absolutely fucking ruinous for Atletico, yeah. by the way, and a terrible transfer. Yeah, And, you know, they, they spend a lot of time trying to 
get the magic back in the bottle, getting the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, big old boomer. Thanks for your question. That was interesting. Really interesting. I enjoyed that. Um, we're going to finish off with this one from Ruckus Patrick, also on the Discord. So three out of the four questions today from the Discord. You know what to do. Patreon.com forward slash football ramble. But Ruckus Patrick says, what's your favourite football noise? For me, Clive, it's the clink of a ball clipping the post on its way in. Now, before I go to you two, I'm going to give you mine. My favourite all-time football the noise. Portsmouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, In more ways than one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th- that one day I will gra- I'll graduate to that job. <laughs> when he gets too old and he's done, they're going to start. It's a bit like um, when they choose a new Dalai Lama. Right. Um, they're going to have to choose a new bellman. <laughs> I reckon I might have a chance. Yeah, because Anthony Minghella is dead now. So he was the only ever really Portsmouth fan that anyone knew who they were. Are you going to take next Friday off the mailbag so you can get started on your tattoo sleeve? I, I will. I will try that. It's not really a sleeve. Oh, that makes it sound a lot cooler than it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> My favourite football noise has always been, and I don't really know if you get it now as much in modern football because of new stadiums, but at Fratton Park, I used to stand in the Fratton end before it got changed to be an all-seater, and I used to sit in there. But um, the South Stand and the North Stand always had seats in the upper tier, wooden seats. And whenever um, Pompey were attacking down the other end, uh, they would go down a flank or they'd get a corner or something, You'd hear the dung, 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 yeah, dung, dung, so dung, of all the people standing up with the so seats good. flipping up. Oh, that's yeah. nice. So then it'll start going dung, 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 dung. That, that was the sound where you're like, fucking hell, we've got a chance. And that is so um, relatable to me now of what it was like going to watch my team when I was a kid. So that to me, it would always be a sound that's very close to my heart. That's, um, it's interesting you said that because one of the, um, it's not necessarily my favourite sound, but it's something that came up when I looked at this question. Um, Chris Waddle um, used to talk about. Uh, the, his favorite, his, his, well, his ultimately his favorite sound was whenever he'd get the ball, he would hear that because people would be standing up thinking, well, Waddle's got the ball here. Oh, great. Yeah. So he, and he, it was yeah, almost okay. Pavlovian was like, right, I've got to do something. So that's now cool. I need something. Yeah. So he, that's much cooler than mine because yeah. he's actually on the other end of it. No, but I mean, that's a brilliant. Like, I, I, I love that. Like, the, just the way people stand up. So mine's, I've, I've got two, and mine's similar to that. Mine is the silence before the cheer. Yeah. When the ball drops to someone in the box and you're like, He's going to shoot. Yeah, and everyone goes quiet. And yeah. often you only really see it when they show like crowd reactions because you don't necessarily acknowledge it when you're watching the game. Mm. But you know when they show the crowd reactions and there's the gasp as the chance comes mm. and then there's just that little wait. Yeah. Mm. And the other one, my, I think this is my favourite noise, is the ripple of the net when it goes into the side netting and and kind of rolls into spins the... Spins around. Spins around into the back yeah. of the net because it... I appreciate you don't really hear it, but there's something even aesthetically about it and, and orally, of course, that remind, that just speaks to me of um, just a snooker ball rolling into a pocket. Yeah. Well, the best snooker sound is when it smacks into the back of the pocket. It was a big old fucking hard shot. Oh, no, I don't like that. I just um, like, I like the silence of the drop. Andy, another one we can all get behind is presumably the noise that Anthony makes when someone goes through the back of him. <laughs> but that's probably not your one. No, well, uh, if, if we're talking about like goal-specific noises, I think one particular moment is when Erling Haaland scores his second goal and I was at the game for Dortmund one, against yeah. PSG and there's just this oh, yeah. rattle of the net it's yeah, so yeah, yeah. satisfying he I, shakes yeah. the foundations of the ground yes yeah, yeah. I can never watch that goal on, on, on silent but I have to I guess represent being a League 2 fan a, a little bit I think the double noise and you touched on it with Anthony maybe you're thinking of the Newport game where you have absolute avalanche of a centre half hitting the forward slash winger and you hear the thwack of defender on attacker and then just a half second later the ball bouncing off the advertising board. yeah nice mm. that's a proper non-league sound if you don't want yeah. to say that as well oh for speaking sure speaking of the best non-league sound unquestionably the best non-league sound is um, the, 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 the booming of the scratchy distorted speaker <laughs> at Peckham Town when Peckham score and Buru Banton's Badder Than Them comes on the, uh, yeah, that's, on, that, on that, the PA. That's pretty good. When, when, you, when you said the, the boom and yeah. when you talked about non-league, I thought you were going to talk about something else because the first couple of seasons that AFC Wimbledon were in existence, which is like level nine, really, as, as, mm-hmm. as, we, as we are in England, um, the, uh, another of the teams near the top of the Combined Counties League was Ash United. And uh, none of these teams had a lot of fans, so you notice the behaviour of individual fans quite a lot. So, yeah, yeah. like Wimbledon, were taking like four thousand f- to, to to places. All right, Andy, sure so, enough. So lots, of, so lots of these. Well, well, it was to put it in context. Like a lot of these teams were used to playing in front of thirty people. Yeah, and so you had this guy at Ash United, who which is out near Aldershot, and he, he used to 
f- for like 90 minutes, just go boom, boom, Ash United, boom, boom, <laughs> Ash United for like the whole time. Wonder what he's doing now. He was a postie. And that man was Pete Donaldson. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Football Ramble Mailbag. It's lovely to have you with us as ever. And um, we are part of the ACAST Creator Network. If you want to get your questions in for next week's episode, just a reminder, um, you can. Um, Tweet us, you can Instagram us, but the best way of doing it is either email our show at footballramble.com or you will get priority if you're one of our Patreon members. Patreon.com forward slash football ramble. Get it in on the Discord, a vibrant community full of football fans having a lovely old chat. I should know because I'm one of them. Do subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast as well. On Monday, we'll be back. I'll be back with Marcus. Marcus is back on Monday, everyone. And it'll be me, Marcus, Jim, and Pete. So we look forward to seeing you then. Until then, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Look after yourselves and each other. Say goodbye, Vish. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from Andy. Goodbye. It's goodbye from me as well. Goodbye. Thank you for watching a clip from the Football Ramble podcast. So don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an upload. A single upload. Don't miss out on the uploads. The uploads are in. Oh, <laughs>